from Public Radio International. I'm Christopher Leiden. This is Open Source. Who owns what out there in the creative culture? And just what's involved when someone other than the author copies, quotes, samples, appropriates, cribs, plagiarizes, or is inspired by it? Speaking for the movie business years ago, Jack Valenti said that the video copier is to the American film producer and the public what the Boston Strangler was to the woman at home alone. But there have been other views among artists along the way. Thomas on our website reminds us that Woody Guthrie, writing hillbilly songs in the Depression, copyrighted each tune but added in print. Anybody caught singing it without our permission will be mighty good friends of ours because we don't give a darn. Publish it, write it, sing it, swing to it, yodel it. We wrote it and that's all we wanted to do. Against the claims of intellectual property, novelist Jonathan Lethem's case for plagiarism, from the agony to the ecstasy of borrowing, is next on Open Source. I'm Christopher Leiden. This is Open Source, a radio conversation we invite you to use, pass on, and improve at radioopensource.org. But give us credit, too. On the matter of who owns artistic expression or even the fruits of genius, Dizzy Gillespie said memorably in defense of jazz players charged with lifting licks from Charlie Parker, he said, you can't steal a gift. Bird gave the world his music, and if you can hear it, you can have it. But tell that to the intellectual property enforcers for, say, Walt Disney, which lifted Snow White from the Brothers Grimm, but now, by act of Congress, owns images like Mickey Mouse into eternity, almost. Our guest, Jonathan Lethem, argues marvelously in Harper's Magazine this month, and he steals ideas and phrases right and left as he does it, that open source is the rule of art, back to Shakespeare's lifting from Plutarch's lives, and all the more so in this digital age. Argue back, and thanks for sharing at www.radioopensource.org. Jonathan Lethem joins us from New York City. He's the novelist of Motherless Brooklyn and the forthcoming You Don't Love Me Yet, among many other books. His article in the current issue of Harper's is entitled The Ecstasy of Influence. He calls it a plagiarism. Jonathan Lethem, welcome with thanks to the world of open source. The whole website world of of our page and our staff, our office, is in awe of your piece and your argument. Well, thank you so much. I tell you, you're not trying to change the copyright law so much as to teach us something about the artistic process, that it lives in the so-called gift economy. Do I, well, do I, I, take I right? like that description very much. I, you know, I think of the piece as a provocation, and um, not even as a necessarily a, um, a, a teaching or a, a teaching device or a lecture. It's my attempt as an as a working artist to kind of climb inside this very uh, problematic world of of assumptions that are handed down to us in the form of copyright laws and also cultural, you know, uh, in you know, inhibitions hmm. or um, injunctions against uh, plagiarism or copying and try to try to feel my way back out through them by 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 reinterpreting the the notions a little bit. I started to think, you know, part of it for me, of course, comes out of uh, the analogous arts as a as a as a writer. Uh, I inherit one set of assumptions about um, copying or borrowing or what's called plagiarism but as a music fan someone who adores uh sampling and quotation mm. and allusion in the music i listen to and as a, a a fan of collage and appropriation in the visual arts you know many of the artists i uh i grew up liking in these different realms were uh instinctive plagiarists essentially yes. by the standards that um that i often see applied within the literary arts or architecture for example i mean the joy of walking through a building that has um, so many parents, so many inspirations, so many places, or and names we we simply don't know. Sure, it, it's funny because it goes against the law, the logic of the law, but it it it, it makes so much sense that art is not about finding a lonely rock someplace and pulling something out of your your deepest unconscious. It's a matter of it's much. Uh, it's a much more social. More, it's entering the market and grabbing, of course it's, combining. It's, it's responsive. It it you know the art instinct is a is a conversational one. It wants to reach out to 
uh, other beings and other artworks and declare itself and commune and and imitate and and alter. It's it's a kind of uh, it seems to me a absolute principle of the creative act as I've known it and as the artists I've uh, adored and studied seem to express it and as the 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 writers and and artists that I talk to and compare notes with would describe it that there's almost a kind of um, universal uh, imitative origin. Everyone makes a parody yes. or a or a a kind of a a quotation first. Every you know every cartoonist begins as a tracer, and every um, every you know artist tries to figure out whether they can draw Tippy the the turtle head from the <laughs> from the, the the you know magazine ads of the of the seventies uh, before they decide to try to draw something of their own. It's sort of basic, and it, it's. I think one of the places I find the paradox expressed most beautifully is in the, you know, voices of some of the the writers, the novelists uh, we think of as the most absolutely singular kinds of voices. Beckett. Well, Beckett actually wrote kind of Joycean parodies initially. Uh, Ernest Hemingway, whose influence is so overwhelming and so, is such a singular right. uh, uh, maker of, of sentences that he changed American literature utterly – began by writing these Sherwood Anderson uh, parodies. You know, he published a book of them. And The Sun Also Rises was a was a reversion of Henry James, really, and the American, uh, not the American, um, the, the ambassadors in Paris, Americans in Paris. Um, right. it, 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 of course, is endless. Your title, The Ecstasy of Influence, is itself a kind of parody of Harold Bloom's um, the agony, was it? The anxiety of influence. The anxiety of influence. But yeah. I, I wonder, is it not still the artist's job, every every artist's job, to find his or her own voice after yes. the long process of of imitation and study? Uh, that couldn't. There couldn't. There could be no better and more perfect distillation of what an artist is always trying to do, is always meant to do, but the paradox of this is that their voice is itself comprised of a response, a collection, an assemblage of materials, tools, motifs that are available, that are present around them in the culture and in the art that they are are surrounded by. How could it be any other way? And what we want from every artist is that they surprise us and show us something unprecedented. But what that desire and that description always understates is the fact that this act is itself innately supported by response, appropriation, imitation. That, that Jonathan, for something can, to be rec- I, oh, I, you go ahead. Forgive me. I was just wondering, how did you learn this in your own experience as a writer? Well, I I think I had a, um, you know, I was trained as a. I grew up in the in the home of a painter. My father's a a a, 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 a an expressionist painter. A, a figurative expressionist, and and his own work um, is uh, it's not full of quotations, but it's um, typical of twentieth century painting in that it's it doesn't um, it it doesn't refuse the possibility of quotation. It it mm. it makes use of uh, things it sees around it, and what's more, the kind of art where he schooled me and the kind of painting. We admired when we would walk around a museum. Well, there were you know painters like Picasso who was incorporating uh, African primitive art, and there were painters like the Surrealists who used co- literal collage methods, but also um, often made parodies of Renaissance compositions. You know, uh, like Max Ernst's Madonna and Child. And then, of course, there was the explosion of American pop art. You know, everyone from Rauschenberg to Johns to to Clay's Oldenburg to uh, Warhol were incorporating images from other artists, from the culture, from photography, um, and and so I I came I, I was trained first as a painter, and I came to think of things I think along those lines. Whereas so many other writers come out of either academic writing mm. first, where they've written a lot within the the context of academy, they've written a dissertation or or uh, you know innumerable papers before they begin writing fiction or something that's sort of outside of that framework or they they work as journalists they do a mm. lot of uh stuff in in the journalistic context well now if you look at 
um, what writers inherit from the context of the academy and from journalism, there's a lot of uh, emphasis put on the um, kind of ethics of copying. Everyone's very conscious that to, to, to be a, a proper student, you mustn't plagiarize. And everyone's conscious that right. to be a kind of uh, a good working journalist, you, you mustn't, you know, cobble together your, your pieces too much or too obviously from pre-existing journalism. Well, I didn't think that way. I thought to be a good artist, you're probably going to be cobbling together stuff from all sorts of sources because every artist I admired seemed to do that. And so you when, know, of course... It's interesting. I... All the examples you're giving are sort of pre-digital. I mean, Picasso appropriating African masks or, uh, you know, the Demoiselle stolen or, or the inspiration from Ang or Delacroix, all of that collage work in the 20th century precedes uh, everything that can be done now with, you know, iPhoto or all the all the audio copying yeah. machinery. Um, is it your... I mean, your 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 point, your 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 sermon to us, I think, is really to relax about it. To, to uh, absolutely, I mean, to relax about it and become interested in it, rather than to panic, to become fascinated and interrogated and explore all the possibilities, which include isolating areas of activity that we might say mm, that's not so great. You know, I mean, there are certainly anyone and, and people who are inclined to uh, uh, protest or or disagree with me. Uh, will 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 always mention uh, egregious plagiarisms instances where someone's taken something and added nothing represent misrepresented themselves as creating something they didn't and look anyone can consent that x y and z were kind of contemptible very lame very right. uh, uninspiring or demoralizing instances of borrowing or copying but on the other hand there are so many other kinds and all of these tend to get bundled into these uh, very uh, stern and and um, and and uh, I think very uncomfortable uh, prohibitions. And what I'd like to do is kind of dissolve the prohibition and say, well, let's just go ahead and actually look at all the instances and all the activities and figure out which which ones we're we're thrilled about and which ones seem awkward to us. I love it, and it is a way to to see all of artistic history. Um, in a different way, and probably for what it is. I mean, to go through the Louvre, certainly in French 18th, 19th, 20th century painting, it is a kind of history of cannibalizing great ideas, topping them, studying them, being enthralled uh, with the last one, and tearing, you know, tearing the temple down and rebuilding something new with the old stone. Certainly, 20th century jazz is the same story sure. of endless emulation and homage and improvement, a kind of competition running historically. We're talking about Jonathan Leatham's marvelous article in Harper's Magazine called The Ecstasy of Influence. We'll be back. Hi, this is Brendan. I'm the open source blogger in chief. Jonathan Leatham has been talking about an article he plagiarized for Harper's. In our office, Greta spent many, many hours tracking down the links to originals of each and every one of Leatham's plagiarisms. Benefit from her labors on the site. Also, in his research for our show on global warming and oceans, Sam developed an obsession with jellyfish, evidently one of the few animals that thrives in ever-warming salt water. He'll tell you all about it in the place where you can float translucently. RadioOpenSource.org. Open Source is produced in association with WGBH Radio in Boston. This is Open Source from PRI. I'm Christopher Leiden. This is Open Source. We're talking about artistic influences in the age of digital copying, but maybe for all time. We're inspired by Jonathan Leatham's article in the current Harper's Magazine which he largely plagiarized, mostly, or, or, or so many brilliant phrases in it, although he fesses up at the end. Um, Siva Vadyanathan also joins us from New York. He teaches culture and communication at New York University. He blogs at Sivacracy and is the author of a book which sort of gives away his point called Copyrights and Copy Wrongs, The Rise of Intellectual Property and How It Threatens Creativity. Welcome back. Siva. Thanks, Chris. What's the effect of copyright law, in your view, on the creative process, and what is the threat here? 
Well, it, it, the real story is just in the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a remarkable change, not only in the technologies we use to produce works of art and, and the technologies we use to reproduce and distribute works of art, but in the anxiety that goes along with it, the, mm. um, the sort of encroachment of the threat of legal sanctions, the, uh, the increase in the power of surveillance by either publishers or previous artists. Um, in other words, we're all deeply afraid of crossing some line. Copyright and the sort of ethical world of plagiarism end up being um, huge sources of anxiety, largely because they are not easy to understand. People tend not to agree on the basic terms. And it's uh, it seems to be um, an, uh, an omnipresent factor in any form of culture or communication. So I, I like to think, for instance, this this show, right, it's called Open Source. If this show had been produced 30 years ago, it would have just been called radio. Uh, you know, why do we need a term like open source? Why do we need a term like open source to apply to cultural production and distribution? Why do we need a term like open source to apply to this show? Why do we need a term like open source to apply to software? The reason is that in just the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen the rise of a completely different model of cultural distribution, what I call the proprietary model. Yes. Right. Basically, I, I wrote an article last year called Open Source is Culture, Culture is Open Source, in which I make a point in not nearly as uh, elegant terms as Jonathan did, but basically that, that what we think of as open source is basically culture. It's how human beings have organized themselves, communicated with each other, joined each other. Um, uh, forged identities, um, and most importantly, grooved and danced for centuries, right? This is basically how people have always dealt with each other. It's just in recent years we've imposed these interesting cages, legal cages, psychological cages, ethical cages around this level of sharing. There's an anxiety here, sort of a legal uh, uh, anxiety, quite different from what Harold Bloom wrote about the poet's problem in getting out from under the shadow of John Keats, say. Uh, yeah. How did that arise? And is this a passing fancy of the Walt Disney Company, for example, that that they can own these images wherever they got them forever? Well, you know, there's an interesting conflation among these three different um, uh, sort of conversations. One, the legal conversation, the the ability to stake out territory uh, in the in the economics of culture, right? And you know, copyright is several hundred years old and only recently became a problem. Uh, you know, for most of the history of copyright, it worked really well. It filled our libraries with books. It filled our world with music. And it did so with enough breathing space mm. that one could create a career like, for instance, Bob Dylan's, right? Completely right. based on um, you know, obvious footnotes to uh, to creators who have come before. You know, his uh, the way that he would overtly pay homage to uh, his predecessors, especially what he got through, was obvious. The way Led Zeppelin uh, paid tribute to uh, to blues musicians that was all completely allowed under copyright um, for the longest time, and people didn't have an anxiety about mm. it. It was just the way it was. Now, um, what you have then is in the recent in the recent decades a, 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 an overwhelming corruption of the copyright laws by large media corporations, Disney being the most guilty in this case. Um, and then we have in the sort of public discourse a blending of of anxieties about plagiarism and anxieties about copyright infringement, which are in fact two very different acts. Plagiarism is an ethical abrogation. It's one in which you violate the norms of an interpretive community or a creative community, either you know a, a, mm. a group of academics or scientists or uh, a group of poets or songwriters. And and each of these communities has its own set of rules, as uh, as Jonathan explained. Um, and you know when it comes right down to it. What we think of as plagiarism, the theft of ideas, um, is actually something that falls outside of copyright. Copyright does not protect ideas. What is that um, introduction it, of nasty words like theft that that, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of get my guard up? D Dave Morello writes on our website, I would never have seen an Ingmar Bergman film if it were not for Woody Allen's Love and Death, nor would I know who Clarence Ashley or Doc Boggs were if it weren't for Bob Dylan, I wouldn't own any Jimmy Smith records if the Beastie Boys hadn't sampled him on their records. I'm also thinking of Jazz World, where sort of uh, call and response or, or trading fours or trading eights, a kind of conversation, is a matter of sort of top this. It is a conversation, and it starts with the other. I'm also thinking of one of my favorite Errol Garner 
blues recordings, Red Top, it quotes everything, including Pop Goes the Weasel, and Every Little Breeze Seems to Whisper Louise, and Charlie Parker's Now is the Time. It's, it's, that's the whole fun of the, of the musical conversation. How did we get out of that culture, sort of, I mean, you can't imagine jazz players on a bandstand saying, wait a sec, that, that was my line. You stole that. You're going to have to talk to my lawyer. There's Jonathan here. The only possible way to respond to putting those acts in this in the light of this conversation is to, well, to, to quote Judge Posner and say, if that's plagiarism, we want more plagiarism, which he said, of course, in the context of Shakespeare's plays, which are cobbled together from an immensity of historical and cultural sources and could never sustain the kind of uh, ethical framework that we put artworks into right at the moment, or at least literary artworks. Uh, what I was going to say, you, you, you said uh, words like theft. I've, you know, uh, Siva, thankfully, walked us up to the fact that plagiarism is not, not a crime. There is no, uh, no one in jail for plagiarism. It can't be uh, uh, either, a, um, you can't be accused of plagiarism in court, nor, and this is important, can you ever be defended or cleared of plagiarism. But it, in is fact, is a word. Is this true? It, yeah, it's not a cause of legal action. I mean, copyright infringement is, but there's this very small intersection of these two sets, plagiarism and copyright infringement. And that small intersection comes in the most egregious and dumb versions of plagiarism where where you simply are facing a deadline and you pick up George Will's column from <laughs> six months ago and you put your name at the top and you run it as some uh, boneheaded columnist did when I was uh, working at a college newspaper many years ago. You know, th- that's the sort of uh, intersection between plagiarism as an ethical abrogation and copyright infringement as a legal abrogation. Our, blo- our blogger-in-chief, time- let me introduce Brendan Greeley, w- would be calling from jail if he if he if plagiarism <laughs> were a crime. Brendan? That's all I do. I steal from what you people write. Um, Peggy Sue writes on the site, in ancient China, plagiarism was considered an honor. Silvio Rabioso adds, uh, Cervantes had to deal with apocryphal sequels to his magnificent and wildly popular novel. In his authorized sequel, he has his characters meet their plagiarized doppelgangers in a Barcelona print shop. He did not rely on a legal framework to confront imposters, so how do we get from that to cease and desist letters? So, um, right now, you have a popular author, Ian McEwen, is paying for alleged plagiarism culturally, not just legally, but culturally. What is it about the 20th century that makes plagiarism a cultural sin, where it wasn't in other centuries and other places? Yeah, I would I would actually limit it to the very end of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st. Uh, you know, McEwen was doing what McEwen has done for years, what every novelist has basically done. Um, and, and that is right past a series of influences, uh, right over them. A, a big case from last summer, right? Dan Brown was hauled into court in... Uh, in England, uh, because a couple of sort of pseudo historians decided that uh, their uh, rough account of conspiracy within the Catholic Church had shown up in the skeleton of Da Vinci Code. So uh, he gets hauled into court uh, and has to face a, a copyright suit. Now, the judge wisely tossed it right out because under copyright, one cannot protect ideas. And what Dan Brown had relied on from their previous work was their ideas. Um, they tried to twist and expand copyright to cover ideas. And many plaintiffs in copyright suits do that sort of thing. So, look, nothing stops you from being sued. Nothing stops a, a, a hungry plaintiff from suing you, even if he or she does not have a good case under copyright. Often it's important enough just to file a suit. You know, Steven Spielberg has seen his movies held up because uh, one or another uh, historian has decided that it's worth shaking down the studio and Spielberg himself. That And that's the sort of stuff we have now in this hyper-litigious environment. But it doesn't respect the health that we need uh, to actually have a rich culture. So first, we'll kill the lawyers. That was Shakespeare. Mark Hustler <laughs> joins us from Asheville, North Carolina. He's a founding member of the band Negative Land. And we introduce him with what may be a familiar sounding new song from the band called No Business. Everything about it is appealing, stealing everything that graphics will allow. 
Mark Hosler and Negative Land assembled that takeoff on Irving Berlin and Ethel Merman without clearing rights or asking anybody's permission. They've been doing this sort of thing since the 1980s. Mark Hosler, welcome. How do you, hey. get, how do you get away with it? Uh, well, apparently we just do it. We just do. <laughs> um, that, that, and that's... Uh, uh, um, your, your other guests have, have put uh, said a lot of things I was thinking to say, but said it much more eloquently than I might. But I think it's also uh, uh, very important to just keep doing this kind of work and, <laughs> and setting examples that, you know, this, this stuff can exist. It does exist. We didn't ask permission, but there it is. And, and uh, it's been out for uh, over a year, and we haven't heard any lawyers, uh, you know, haven't shown up on our doorstep. And Keep moving and don't... don't that's right. Don't... Maybe they're listening now, and this is finally when we get in trouble. <laughs> this could be the moment. Reuse. Yeah. Adaptive reuse. I was reuse. driving around in a car and heard Ethel Merman singing this song, and I just suddenly it hit me, and I thought, oh, well, we could re-edit her so she's singing about stealing music. Where did you get that, that the, the word of her saying stealing? Well, it's in the song. And then we also remembered that uh, I think another, uh, Don in Negative Land realized he had this wonderful disco version of her all when she tried to make a comeback in the late 70s, and she kind of redid it, and we just decided to intercut them. You're not hearing that part of the song, but it, it sort of mutates from cutting up the, uh, the version from the 50s and then, uh, cuts, and then uh, mutates into the disco version that she did. So, Mark, reuse is your method, so to speak, uh, and it's, it's your medium, but it's also, in some sense, your your message. What What's the message? Uh, well, our work covers a lot of different things, and uh, we've been appropriating before the word sampling even existed or before we'd even heard of the word appropriation. Uh, I started doing this with my friends uh, when I was 16 or 17 years old, and we just mm-hmm. liked how it sounded. We We liked taking things out of their original context and cutting them up, but this was back in the days of uh, reel-to-reel recording tape and razor blades, and rearranging the sounds, mixing them in with original things that we'd created. And um, most of the time, that's what we do. It's a combination of original music we've composed and sounds that we've made, uh, combined with things that we just take from absolutely anywhere, you know, shortwave radio, talk shows, advertisements, children's records, telephone answering machine tapes, radio shows talk shows like this one, um, <laughs> you, you, and, you, and it, all just, it, it, it all just inspires us, and it just gets us excited, and there's something about, and, and it was alluded to earlier in your show, there's something where it feels like you're having this really conversational dialogue with this mass culture that's being shoved down your throat, whether you like it or not, and why do I need to ask permission you know, uh, to do that? No one asked me permission to uh, put up a Pepsi billboard near my home. <laughs> So I'm not sure why I have to ask permission to take some part of a Pepsi ad and, and cut it up. It, it's a very, uh, you know, as, as was sort of said earlier, it's a, it's a, in a way it's a very common sense argument. As the years went by, and we, our first record came out in 1980, we started thinking oh. more and more about what we were doing with this kind of work, what were we trying to say by appropriating the media, and it, the, gradually our work became more overtly critical and more political. And then, of course, finally, you know, our our claim to fame, we don't have a hit record, but we had a hit lawsuit in 1991. Hmm. Uh, you know, we were sued for doing the U2 single. And uh, that really, I think, really uh, politicized us even more and really pushed us into having to look at the work we were doing and why and start to speak out publicly about it. Well, who sued you? And what did, uh, what did Bono have to say? Oh, I think they tra- sort of get kept in the dark. But we were sued by U2's record label, their publisher, uh, and... Uh, um, yeah, for copyright infringement, trademark infringement, fraud, defamation of character, pretty much everything they could throw, you know, they could throw at us. And you're, so, you're so some of our work has continued to be about these issues, uh, uh, but definitely not all of it. Uh, but we've always continued to be inspired by things that we find, and pretty much had a feeling as we entered into the new millennium that collage and plagiarism and appropriation was going to become kind of like the preeminent art form of, you know, the last part of this century and into the, and into the next one. And I really think it has. From your own work or others, Mark, I'd be interested to know, what's your, what would you enter into the Hall of Fame for uh, a really original work of art that is based on appropriation, or as it's called in Jonathan Leatham's article, appropriationism? What would I enter? Yes. Well, I, yeah. You say, I mean, you say it is the art of the moment, but... Well, I'm just seeing that in per, in terms of people's practice. You know, I, 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 I want to hear or if you say Matt, look at the amount of what is it that just showed up on on uh, YouTube was um, 
the San Francisco Chronicle has started putting online for you to listen to the phone calls of complaints that people make to the to the um, to the newspaper about things they get wrong in their stories, and things people are pissed off about. And they put this up online for people to listen to. And within just a few days of it going up, people started taking those recordings and then making pieces of music and using them in, <laughs> as the vocals and cutting them up and then putting them out and making videos and sticking these things out. And there's this incredibly fast uh, response time now that's happening of things hitting into the, you know, hitting the culture and people grabbing it and cutting it up and rearranging it and making stuff uh, out of it. If I could interject, this is Siva. I think what you're what you're getting to, Chris, is also this idea that um, you're you're searching for something where where some great value is added, where there's a substrate that's it's sort of commonly known, and an artist comes along and does a new version that just blows everybody's mind. Um, and you can actually think of Elvis's Sun Sessions, where every one of those cuts was a well known uh, R and B or country hit, uh, and yet Elvis added Elvis to it, and he added a particular tone and attitude and and rhythm to it and and brought it to a new level and changed the world. So and, and that's the sort of stuff that um that artists have done for years and what what Mark's doing now what Negative Land's doing now is another step from that. Uh basically referring to things around them, referring to the to the elements of the culture that as he said are pushed upon him, forced upon all of us and saying, "Look, I'm going to make sense of the language that I'm forced to deal with in this culture. Uh, and that's why their entire body of work is so brilliant. It is a comment on the condition of being in the United States in the last 20 years. And, and Mark, also, take a bow. Go ahead. Oh, just to also sort of paradoxically enough, in, in searching, you know, when, when we started out, we were really trying to do something really different and really unusual and really unique. And we wanted to make something that sounded like nothing we'd ever heard. And sort of ironically and paradoxically enough, what sounded like nothing we'd ever heard before was taking things that already existed and recombining them in all sorts of ways. And, and like I said, it was just – we were totally unaware of the laws. It was just an inspiring uh, way to work. And I, lo- I, I, I love the fact that you're not thinking about the law especially or the lawyers. Is, is there a 30-second version of your story about – uh, uh, your song about Michael Jackson? Oh, well, this is a good example of how confusing and strange it can get. Real fast. We made a track uh, that was called Michael Jackson that used a sample from a flexi-disc record that I found in the basement of a church, of a nursery school where I was a teacher at. And it was on this track on a record label that uh, we were no longer working with, SST Records, when it got, came out. Fatboy Slim sampled it. Cut, and, to, cut uh, to the chase. We've got to take a break. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wanted you to finish the story. Well... Uh, oh, I'm, are, we, are we on our break now? <laughs> no, uh, we're trying to get there. But I, I, I we, we. Oh, we, I thought we, you said you. I thought you were interrupting me to lead me into that break in that kind of aggressive way you talk show hosts do. Yeah, well, that's sort of the idea. We'll be right back. I'm Christopher Light, and this is Open Source. We're talking about creativity and copying and lifting in an age of digital reproduction but going way, way back into the very nature of creation as a, as a social, as a, a communal, as a hand-me-down kind of process. Mark Hosler, uh, forgive me, I, I, I was rushing you into your you Michael sure Jackson. You sure were. Nerd. You did a fine job of it. And you avoided the lasso, but <laughs> it, 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 here's your chance again. Oh, dear. Um, let's see. We did a record, and I'll start again. <laughs> We did an album, put in an album in 1987. It was called Escape from Noise. It had a track on it called Michael Jackson. And this used, among many other things, a recording of a little girl saying, Michael Jackson, look what you've done. This was taken from a flexi disc, one of those flexible type records you get in the back of a cereal box or in National Geographic. Right. And I got it. I actually, I actually did actually steal it from the library of a church that was in the basement of a place where I was working as a nursery school teacher at the time. So this made its way onto this album. Ten years or more later, Fatboy Slim took the little bit of her saying this and used it in a track he made, which he also called Michael Jackson. And he was trying to pay clearance fees to use it. Unfortunately, he was paying it to a record label we were no longer working with, SST Records. And I heard about this sort of through the grapevine, and I was trying to reach him, saying, no, we don't want your thousand dollars for the sample. We don't even. We don't believe in that. You know, you can take it. You can have it. And 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 on top of that, we don't own the rights to it anyway because we appropriated it without permission. Well, he, he his label went ahead and paid the thousand dollars. I never could reach him directly, and we then found out that the track 
that he'd made, sampling from our sample of a thing we had never cleared, had now been, was, he had now licensed it to be used in a Coca-Cola commercial. <laughs> <laughs> so we put out a press release pointing, just pointing out how incredibly stupid and ridiculous this whole thing was, which really upset his record label, I think because they were afraid Coke would find out that they had now bought the rights to use a song that had a sample in it that really wasn't cleared at all. And... Um, uh, yeah, so we just, that's something we ended up publicizing. The story is a good example of how convoluted and strange and peculiar uh, this whole thing can work out in the real world. And how, again, the, 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 the application of a lot of these laws is for us just sort of downright silly. It, it's very strange as a person who's trying to make really great music, trying to make great art, trying to provoke and entertain people, and to think I have to worry about lo what lawyers think. That I'm supposed to, conf <laughs> you know, consult with a lawyer about my artistic impulse. I mean, let the, sort let of the lawyers become musicians. Don't you become a lawyer. Keep doing it. Yeah. Keep, keep lifting. And uh, but you know what? Don't I'd worry love about to a hear thing. Your other guests talk about is um, there's an interesting uh, collision between all these issues and and the basic notions of private property and capitalism in this country. I mean, it it, it really really are you know you're really having an incredible. Um, uh, headbutting going on there between between those kind of ideas. It'll all be over by the time this program is... Uh, yes, uh, we'll uh, have settled it. Nails the issue, I promise. Mm -hmm. Mark Hostler, thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. Mike Doty joins us from hey. New York City. What's happening? You tell me. You're the solo musician, <laughs> formerly uh, fronting the band Soul Coughing, and the hope was, Mike, that you would demonstrate uh, the process of of all of these strands coming together in a in the making of an original piece. Oh, well, yeah, I brought a guitar along. And um, I did this uh, this conference of copyright lawyers. I think that's what it was at Harvard a couple of years ago, which was, you know, super bizarre for me. But, uh, you know, just in sort of going through uh, my process of appropriation, which I think is, you know, just sort of in line with the oral tradition of playing music, um, I, just, I just played this, which any guitar player would find... Uh, like the most boneheadedly simple example, but this riff is like Louis. a 50 million songs. Yeah, Louis, Louis, oh baby, and it's a wild thing. I'm super out of tune. And uh, hang <laughs> on, Snoopy. You know, it's it's a zillion songs, and I was. Uh, I made my last record with this guy, Dan Wilson, uh, who was in this band, Semisonic, that had a gigantic hit in 1998 with the song Closing Time. And hmm. coincidentally, I discovered that Soul Coughing's hit from 1998 uh, was called Circles, and it went, I don't need to walk around in circles, walk around in circles. And his song goes, Closing Time, la, 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 la. Exact same chords. Hmm. Had no idea. How many chords in a row constitute, uh, you know, a a package to, to, to be appropriated? Or one uh, seventy? I don't know, man. It's uh, you mean in terms of what what is uh, plagiarism defined as? Yeah, or, or 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 what what does your ear hear when? How many chords do you have to hear to say, wait a sec, that's. Uh, uh, well, I mean, for me, it, it all. It all comes from the blues, which is the you know the same three chords. Right. Uh, you know what they call the one four five progression, the twelve bar blues. You know, I mean, and it's really the bedrock of you know pop music of jazz. You know, just this simple progression. I I think there's something like innately human about this uh, progression. There's just something got to be pleasurable on on a super super innate deep level to hearing those. You know, Mike Jody, on the on the spectrum from uh, the anxiety to the ecstasy of influence, which is to say, living in this world of of grabbable notions, musically or otherwise, where do you where do you find yourself? Are you anxious or ecstatic? What? <laughs> to be out there well, in the crowd? I'm I'm ecstatic, man. Um, I grew up. Uh, I came to New York in 1988. Uh, I was 18 years old, and it was there was an explosion of hip hop music that was all essentially based on a few different two to four bar snippets of James Brown songs. Hmm. And what this was, was sort of the next technological step up 
from, you know, just 10 years previous to that, when obviously, you know, everybody's essentially working from a folk tradition. So you hear a song, you learn the progression, you know, maybe you steal a little bit of a melody. Um, the verb I always use is to gank, like I gank that beat, I gank that melody, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, but, uh, you know, whereas in the 70s or the 60s going on back, the musician would sort of act as a filter. And so, uh, therefore, the, the, there'd be something like inherently different about uh, the piece because it was, you know, uh, just there's no way that, that somebody's voice or hands is, is going to sound exactly like somebody else's voice or give, hands. Give us a taste, Mike, if you will, of the, of the progressions you would have stolen from lifted gank from James, <laughs> James Brown. Well, I, ta- I talked to your producer earlier today, and he had heard about this thing I did at, at Harvard. And, uh, um, you know, I actually played examples of things I had stolen. There was one uh, thing that uh, was on a, a song of mine where, you know, I usually I just I'm listening to songs. And when it's time to write songs, I go to whatever's in my iTunes. And, and you know, there's some things I steal. There's some things I emulate. There's, you know, and there's, of course, things that are just mine, uh, <laughs> whatever that means. But uh, I played uh, an example of a melody that I had taken, that I had ganked from Iron Maiden, uh, the metal band okay. from, uh, from the 80s, and which I had discovered uh, after sort of playing it through a bunch of times and finding it familiar on some metal level, was actually the melody uh, to When the Saints Go Marching In. <laughs> so I'm, I, you know, I can't like shout out what the tunes are because basically uh, you know, I make my money from copyright, for better or for worse, and... I don't want to get sued. I don't want to have to give away 50% of my publishing income on that particular song. But at Harvard, I actually played the examples. You know, another thing that I'd taken from a Depeche Mode song, you know, I mean, I don't know, some, you know, copyright ambulance chaser somewhere is like whipping out his Depeche Mode box set right now, maybe, and going through the entire, you know, catalog. But I don't know. Our blogger in chief, Brendan Gritty, is going gonna, is gonna to credit you every time he uses the word gank. Excellent. <laughs> right, Brendan? <laughs> um, well, some I of us got that actually... from somebody else, so there, that's exactly what we're rocking about tonight, right? I was going to point out that some of us have heard the word gank before this, uh, this show, but uh, Allison, <laughs> Allison right writes on, on the man. blog, uh, It seems to me that in the history of copyright, the people concerned with protection have not been the creators, but the distribution companies that hope to make money from somebody else's creation. So it's a question for Mike. Are you, as an artist, are you yourself concerned with lifting and getting lifted or ganking and getting ganked or, or do you leave that to the labels who you call uh, the the ambulance ch- chasers do you let that be somebody else's job well here's a here's a weird story um Solkoffing had a song called super bonbon which was one of our you know we had a couple minor radio hits two years later uh ricky martin came out with a song called shake your bonbon <clears throat> and when he came out with that basically everybody and their mom sent me an email or called me and said you got to sue this guy. You got to get some money. You know, it's payday. Um, and everybody, you know, everybody around me, managers and bandmates and stuff, they, they all wanted a piece of the money. I would have taken the money if they gave it to me. You know, I'm not a saint here. But uh, as it happened, Super Bonbon was the name of, a, of an Italian candy bar that I saw. And I actually wrote something about it in the New York press, and that sort of made the whole, you know, possibility of getting money, you know, fall to pieces. Uh, but... We actually, the lawyers actually hired a uh, a musicologist, a forensic musicologist, mm. to go through the tune and discover what exactly had been stolen, if anything. And w- his conclusion was, you know, well, there is a case that Shake Your Bonbon is taken from Super Bonbon. However, we're certain that it's a, an exact rip of Shake Your Groove thing, the old disco song. So, you know... I didn't get any money, but, you know, the phrase Shake Your Bon Bon was such, such a, uh, uh, a part of the culture around then. I mean, you heard it in punchlines and, you know, rappers, Little Kim would use the phrase as a joke. And I, I was just kind of glad to be part of the cultural process, you know, to have seen the candy bar and my song, which may or may not have been the other song, which et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Mike, leave the fault. lawyers out of it entirely. Do, do, <laughs> a lot. Do, I don't do that, man. I, I'm always, I got my lawyer on, on the phone right now. <laughs> listening on no, imagine there were no lawyers. Do the, do the artists themselves uh, keep track of where these, these riffs and wrinkles and tunes and 
structures come from? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's either, uh, you know, a lot of uh, hip hop music, um, a lot of sampling based music is about taking something and startling everybody by recontextualizing it. So that certainly is uh, is, you know, I, I wouldn't use the word tribute, but but definitely its source is significant in how it's used. And I, is, I, I do think there is such a thing as stealing, you know, as opposed to ganking. You know, you can, uh, uh, I don't know, man, it's a, it's a blurry line that I choose not to define. Well, I've, this is Steve. I mean, I think one of the, the keys here is that value added, right? If, 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 if someone is playing one of Mike's songs and doesn't bring something special to it, uh, Mike might feel, or any artist would feel, like, well, you're 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 simply riding on my stuff. Whereas, if that person, as Mike says, recontextualizes it, pushes it to another level, maybe uses it in a completely different way in another work, um, that can either be a tribute mm-hmm. or it can be a challenge, right? And then and then people are sort of working through a conversation over over time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is Jonathan here. I I think it also is worth saying that a lot of this has to do with the difference between a kind of uh, legal or scientific notion of purity as opposed to the deep and innate impurity of the artistic act and the ar- artistic impulse and the reception uh, of art. It's all very, very murky, and, and you, know, you almost have to chase every uh, hmm. ethical instance down on a case-by-case basis. You really can't make these sweeping descriptions, which is why you know, I think Mike was so hesitant to say what he meant by stealing, because he really means he'd only know it in the exact instant that he yeah, spotted it. It's all it, very right. contextual. So think about the difference between Pat Boone and Elvis, right? Pat Boone's music doesn't last for us, <laughs> because he was basically not adding anything good or special to it, whereas Elvis was adding his own twist and accent. Jonathan Leatham, I'm wondering, do you ever Google a phrase that comes into your head to see if it's been written before? Do you ever have to uh, vet your I, own work to see where it came to, from? It wouldn't occur to me to get that self-conscious as I as I worked, but um, what I what I will tell you is that I'm a I'm a particularly conscious, uh, consciously influenced artist. I often, as I'm working, you know, and this is on not just on the level of phrases, uh, which is where you know the 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 Google instrument can kind of chase down resemblance between writers, but more on the level of situations and motifs and tones and moods in a, in, a, in a piece of fiction, I almost always know when I've got a shadow of a Hitchcock film creeping over my thoughts as I make a scene or a, or a tone from a Bob Dylan song or a piece of a Graham Greene novel, I can tell when it's going on. I feel it. And now I, I don't insist that it's hypocrisy that other writers or other artists aren't naming their sources or as, uh, as much in ecstasy to kind of identify them or feel them at the moment of creation, but I do suspect that those same kinds of reverberations are pretty universal, that people it reminds are me of the, the, working it responsively. The composer John Harbison is saying to me one time that we are all, uh, and he's a composer, but he says we're, we're all in some sense the, the sum total of everything we've ever heard, and who knows when, it, when it's going to uh, channel you or, or pop back right. to the surface. Well, there's a quote also that I I, I uh, uh, ganked for for that uh, <laughs> Harper's piece from Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, which is of course also an image of a composite that is something other than the uh, sum of its parts. Um, but Mary Shelley said in her introduction to Frankenstein, uh, "Creation comes not out of the void, but out of chaos." You write in the Harper's piece in a, in, in so many words. Don't pirate my editions. Do plunder. Don't pirate my editions. Do plunder my visions. Where do you draw the line between pirating and plundering? Well, or, or between editions and visions, maybe. You know, the the limited legal instrument of copyright, I'm going to turn this over to Siva, who's just so much better on the history of, of uh, the the cultural, uh, you know, tradition known as copyright. But the the simple uh, protection of my published books, the the right I offer to my publishers and they give me money for to publish my exact sentences as I wrote them in a book exclusively is awfully important to my, uh, you know, uh, being able to pay the rent. I'm grateful that that uh, structure exists. But the larger implications that somehow there is some uh, essence of originality that swarms around every move I make and therefore I should be uh, aggrieved or, or upset or feel violated or 
God help me, you know, hire a lawyer. Every time I see somebody, for instance, uh, make a story about a, you know, a, a private detective with a, 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 a quirk or a tick or a, a, a you know, a kind of a, a behavioral defect is ludicrous. And I, I think it's terribly important that artists uh, remember to be grateful for their engagement with an ongoing cultural discourse, that they, they came from somewhere and their stuff, if they're lucky, will be entered into the language of culture and become useful to others. Right. Chris, this is... See the, the last word, 20 seconds. Yeah, basically copyright, to defend copyright for a second, uh, copyright is supposed to stop piracy. It was invented to create a temporary monopoly for a publisher so that the publisher could sell a, a piece of work at a decent price and not have everyone else copy it and drive the price something close to zero. Um, and that's why the sort of street corner piracy we see in every major city in the world is a big problem to the culture industries. It, it, it erodes the investment that people make in these very expensive products, right? That's very different from what we're talking about here in terms of artistic taking and borrowing and building. Uh, and Ganking, only, in short. Exactly. Over the course of copyright history, you start to see these leaks where, where what once protected the entire work between leather covers uh, starts leaking inside the work, uh, and then people start to monetize small pieces of it, elements of it, phrases, and Siva, that's when and we the, get into trouble. And then we ran out of time. Thank you, Siva Vadyanathan, Jonathan Leatham, Mark Hosler, and Mike Doty. You'll be immortalized here for the word gank. Our show is produced by David Miller, Brendan Greeley, Catherine Bidwell, Chelsea Murs, Robin Amer, and Greta Pemberton, with help from Julia Reichel and Sam Gale Rosen. Robin Moore was our engineer. Mary McGrath is our inspiration. I'm Christopher Lydon. Join us next time on Open Source. PRI. Public Radio International.